My name is Gabriel Mann, and I'm here with Kaya on All Access, and we're going to talk about me and music and stuff like that. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for inviting me to your studio. It's so great to sit down and talk again. It's my pleasure. So Always. Yes. My door is always open. <laughs> or it will be at least for like two more months. I'm leaving. Oh, you're leaving. I'm leaving the business. Forever? No. <laughs> I'm leaving... Uh, I'm... I'm leaving this studio. I've been in this studio for 22 years. Wow. And since before I was really composing music, since I was, when I came out here originally, I was not doing that. Um, but I'm leaving. I'm building a new building. Two miles. Oh. As the crow flies. Oh, that's okay. Awesome. Um, so brand so new space. the next space. time, we can do this again in two yeah. months, and we can do it in a nicer facility. That's awesome. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with this place. We made a lot of great music in here, and it's um, and I will miss it sort of. <laughs> I won't miss the crickets that are in the other room. Yeah. And I won't miss the fact that I can't run the air conditioning all the time, <laughs> stuff like that. So summer but must I get do, hot in here. <laughs> I've made a lot of uh, music in here, so there will That's be amazing. A lot of history here. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, we we talked a while ago. We we did a, a an audio interview. Um, so thank you so much for sitting down for this video interview. So um, I do want to kind of go back and kind of tread over some questions that maybe we touched last time, but let's just start fresh. Let's just start with the, the Gabriel Mann origin story. Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about uh, when in your life did you kind of, when did you discover music and how did that lead to where you are today? Well, I probably discovered music um, in a couple of ways. First of all, my father was the cantor at our synagogue mm -hmm. in San Antonio, Texas, the Orthodox shul. So if you've ever been to an Orthodox synagogue, there's like a guy at the front and he's singing and everybody else is like sort of moaning along with him. And my father has a particularly incredible voice. He's oh, wow. got this huge booming baritone mm -hmm. and um, and so I guess that's really where I noticed music in the first place. Specifically on the high holidays, people would come from miles around to hear my father sing. Wow. And um, he's really something special and sort of from another time, the way that he sings and sort of his whole... Anyway, I, happen, I come from a long line of cantors. His father was a cantor. His uncle was a cantor. Anyway, um, then... So that was one part of music. Yeah. The other thing that uh, I can remember is sort of in junior high and high school, my sister would collect records. When, and then when she went off to college, she had records. And then she would leave them behind mm -hmm. by accident, or maybe I hid them yeah, yeah. or something <laughs> like that, uh, so that I could have them when she left. And so I listened to uh, her records, and her records were basically... The Eagles, Live. Perfect. Uh, cars, The Cars, Heartbeat City. Um, there was a Rolling Stones record, the name of which I can't remember. It had like the woman on the front had Brown Sugar. That was like the big hit on that record. And a few other things that were sort of like, I just wore them out. Yeah, yeah. Like, especially the Eagles, I wore out like crazy. And um, anyway, so those those records were warped also because she went to school in Boston, so she left them on the heater. Oh Maybe that's boy. why she left them behind. Anyway, <laughs> those were two big musical things for me in my childhood. Yeah. I also, I mean, I studied piano. I was like a, it wasn't like amazing. I was just like played piano and I quit. I studied piano from third grade to sixth grade, and then I quit because I didn't like my teacher. She was like big on like corporal punishment. She would like smack oh, wow. me with a ruler and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, um, and then we, uh, and then I, so I quit for three years and then I went to camp. There was a guy at camp playing piano and there were like a bunch of girls around. And I was like, oh, he was playing like songs. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. playing like Journey or whatever. And I was like, 
I got to do that. <laughs> so I went back home and found a new teacher. My mom helped me find a new teacher who was someone that I could play pop music with mm. and also continue like sort of regular piano study. So that was, a, and that started back up in high school. So I stayed with piano until the, I was done with high school. That was the beginning of music for me. Mm. And then I, oh, and then I was in the Alamo Heights Singers. My high school was Alamo Heights. And, uh, and so I was in the Alamo Heights Singers. There were like 16 people in this singing group. My brother was the bass section mm -hmm. and I was the tenor section. And there were like 14 girls. <laughs> <laughs> because like in San Antonio, Texas, it's like really, it's probably still not cool to like be a male singer. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, but I did that and then... So then at what, point your, at what point did you decide to make it a career? I mean, it was kind of a passion, probably a hobby at, when we used to start, but when was it, did you decide to go, okay, I can, I want to make a living out of this? Uh, well, I went to college. Mm -hmm. I skipped, I took a year off between high school and college and played a lot of music in that year off. I was in Israel with a friend of mine who played guitar and we had like a little thing and we would play at like a club and play oh, nice. covers. And that was another sort of like formative moment because suddenly I was sort of like existing in the world as like a musician and people would be like, hey, that guy can kind of like sing. Yeah, yeah. That was interesting. And then, um, and then when I went to college, I went to Penn and I was pre-met and oh, I had wow. no real sort of notion that I was going to do music, um, in any way, but a week into school, I auditioned for an acapella group and, uh, that became a huge part of my life at Penn. Also, I took a class, uh, called the history of the symphony mm -hmm. with a professor named, um, it's not Leonard Bernstein, it was not Lawrence Bernstein, mm -hmm. no relation to Leonard. <laughs> and he was incredible. And I was recently in touch with him again because he just retired. Oh, wow. But this class about the history of the symphony in which you would basically dissect uh, seminal symphonies over the course of like, from like the early 1700s till now, basically. Yeah. Um, and over the course of a semester, you would examine, like, I don't know how many symphonies, like five or six. Wow. And it was just, like, mind-blowing. It changed my whole perspective on, like, what music was and why it was and, like, all of the stuff that goes into it. And just, it was really, um, that was an incredible time. And that basically made me want to be a music major. It was, it was my, one of the first classes I took at Penn. And... Um, and so I was like, well, can't I just do pre-med and be a music major? And mm -hmm. that seemed like a reasonable idea at the time. So I did that, and I was in this acapella group. The acapella group basically was what I did in college. Right. And by the time I was done, I was like arranging a lot of the music for that group, and I was the music director and all of that. And, and uh, then when I was like a junior, I basically stopped pre-med. And I called my parents, and I was like, I can't do this anymore my brain is like splitting in half and and I'm not able to do well in both of these things at the same time mm. and I wasn't particularly good at the pre-med stuff so I, was, <laughs> so I was like well I think I'm just gonna do this music thing and they were like okay we don't really know why you were doing that in the first place wow so that was that made it a lot easier there total and unconditional support. That's amazing. So, so then I met a guy who was in another group and he was like, oh, you should apply to this program that I applied to and went to, or I'm going to, uh, at USC. Because I really had, I mean, I was from San Antonio. There is no, there is no entertainment industry. There's no, there's no anything yeah. of that sort. So like, I didn't really conceive of it as an option. I knew that I liked music. But I wasn't really thinking about writing music for media in any way. Yeah. And, oh, there's one other thing that happened when I was in college, which is that I wrote a song. And I had written some other songs, but, like, this was sort of my first, like, maybe decent song. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we sang this song in my acapella group. 
And then somebody at the show was like part of Rough House Records, which was like a big Philadelphia thing at the time. So I made, I got like a production deal, which mm -hmm. essentially means that they just sort of record some songs for you. Yeah. And, um, and then they see what they can do with them. That was another big thing that happened. So that was like me alone in a studio with a piano and a bunch of like vocal overdubbing. Yeah. That was also very, uh, life-changing experience wow just to be in a in a studio and have like the headphones and you're hearing your own voice and you're like oh my god this piano sounds incredible and like hearing the layering of the vocals and like having a producer sort of tell you like push you a little bit outside of what you would normally do yeah. these are things that are like they were also mind-blowing yeah and and so exciting to me and um Anyway, so I applied to this program at USC, and Buddy Baker, who I'm sure you know of, was the guy running this program at USC, the film scoring program. And I was like, oh, well, that, I guess I could do that. I don't really want to do that, but I want to, like, I want to be a rock star. That's yeah, like yeah. what, I, that was what was going to happen. Right. Obviously. <laughs> and um, so, like, so I applied to this program. He's like, he's like, he's like, it was an amazing application. The application basically consisted of, consisted of a phone call. Uh -huh. He's like, hey, Gabe, I got your application. Why don't you write us some music? So I wrote, he was like, we need like an orchestral thing and a big band thing, which I had no experience with whatsoever, wow. and some other thing. And so the other thing I had, I had, which was a, I had scored a student production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh -huh. It was like piano and like, bass clarinet and like a like an oboe and like a flute and um so i had that i had like the score he, yeah. and he they didn't want recordings they just wanted score oh wow so i sent them the score to that and then i wrote like a little orchestral thing on my macintosh classic <laughs> and like i had like a keyboard that was like this big and finale and i like made it look all nice and then i wrote a big band thing like by hook or by crook i have no idea how that went and I got a call, like, you know, whenever. Yeah. And he was like, hey, this all looks good. <laughs> that was it. So, <laughs> so then I was in that program, and I came to L.A. And it was like a whole other beginning. Yeah. It was crazy. So some of your, uh, so what were some of the, kind of the first jobs you got in composing for media? What was the, did you start off assisting anybody, or did you just kind of, how did you get your first okay. project? Well, so I went, after that program, I went to work for a series of composers, mm -hmm. and I also did a series of other super random jobs. I yeah. worked for Electricia, who was a studio wiring technician. She was like, she was like this super hot bass playing wiring technician. She would wire like Hans's place and like every, she was like wiring everybody wow. at the time. <laughs> and, um, and so I would like drive to her place in the valley, and like everybody was like smoking Marlboro Reds and listening to Black Sabbath, and we, she had like an army of people soldering all day long. And I was one of those people, and she retains a, some of my work on her wall as an example of how not to do stuff. And I was like particularly bad at it. So I, that was one thing I did. And then at some point, I started like a line, I, I did a, a few jobs as an assistant to composers. So one of them was this guy, Dennis Hannigan, who at the time was doing a show called Beekman's World for uh, Nickelodeon. My job was to drive his hard drives from Topanga Canyon to Hollywood, <laughs> spot the show, the next episode, yeah. and then return the hard drive to him in Topanga Canyon, which basically took all day. Yeah. Because, <laughs> so I, but that was like once a week kind of job. Okay. Then, while in Topanga Canyon at the post office, I met another composer named Russ Landau. Russ Landau later became known for doing the music for, um, for Survivor. That's he's right. He's been doing Survivor forever. Yeah. I th I think he still does. I don't I don't really know, but um, so I worked for him in a in an office that was about this big, <laughs> and I had a sampler, and a computer, and it was like really hot. But I did I had a window right here, but. <laughs> <laughs> That was my like my second assistant D job, and then um, and we were dealing a lot with samples. That was my job there. Was like dealing with, like it, at the time, now basically there's like no limit to the amount of samples yeah. that any person can have. 
But at the time, you'd, you were limited by the sort of number of samplers that you had, and they were hardware units, and each hard piece of hardware was like 32 gigs or something, mm -hmm. or 32 megs. I don't know. They were, they were small, and you could only fit like a flute on it or like a <laughs> choir or like whatever it was. So I was constantly loading and unloading and like transferring and copying and doing stuff with the samples. Then... Uh, then I started working for another guy named David Schwartz. David Schwartz became sort of my mentor. And I, the thing that was so great about him was that he was very into how music sounded. Mm. He wanted to hear it coming out of the speakers and have it sound like it was a record. He had come from making records. And um, he's a bass player, so he was always like, like, he would also like be very careful about, he would just always do as many takes as it took. Yeah. It was never a rush. He would stay until three in the morning. Didn't matter. Yeah. And he loved it. He loved his job. He still loves his job. I love, does, yeah, I love David's he's, music. He's, um, so at the time, he had just finished doing Northern Exposure, which is this amazing show. Yeah. And tons of great music in that show. And, and um, anyway, so I worked for him for a little while. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't like the, I was good at certain parts of being an assistant and I was also like eager to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. So I made a record while he was gone on vacation one summer. That was like my first sort of solo album. This is a very roundabout way of answering your question. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but okay, so. <laughs> so I made this record, and I had these friends that I, one of whom I lived with, one of whom was in my, was in my acapella group at Penn, mm -hmm. and had a job here in business development at Universal Music. He was like a record company guy. And he and his buddy were like, okay, we're going to like, this, this is it. We're yeah. going to take this record, and we're going to make you huge. It's going to be awesome. So they were like, okay, the first thing you got to do is you got to change your name. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, so classic. <laughs> and in retrospect, I, I was like, I don't know why I'm listening to these guys. They don't know anything. But I changed my last name. I'm Gabriel Rutman. That's my real okay, name. Yeah, because, I changed yeah. it to Gabriel Mann. And, and it remains that now professionally because I, I, when I started getting work as a composer, people knew me as an artist. And mm -hmm. my artist name was Gabriel Mann. So I didn't want to like mess with that yeah yeah anyway so i made that record and i started playing shows and i would play shows and and uh made another record and then played more shows and i was really earning a living at that point after after i made that record i basically left david and came to work here essentially mm -hmm. we actually started down the street for like a year and it was terrible and then we moved here and um this studio was built with my friends Chris and Becky. Mm -hmm. They built it. It's their, it was theirs. And they, we, the three of us and three other people were in an acapella group, a professional acapella group called Spiral Mouth, which was a, which remains sort of like a sort of, I don't know, there's a little mystique about it. Spiral Mouth. Everybody went on to do all kinds of other things. Yeah, yeah. And um, Becky, I work with all the time. She usually sits right over there. And uh, so with their winnings from our, uh, our little record deal mm -hmm. that we had as a group, they basically built this place. And I was like, well, if you build this place, I'm going to run it and I'll like be the studio guy and I'll like produce people and bring in clients and mix things and whatever. So that is how I was earning a living for a long time while I was making my records wow. and my own records and um, <clears throat> touring as much as I could tour. And I like, Anyway, so I did that for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure other things happened in there. <laughs> uh, I made five solo albums over the years. And the last one I made was in 2007, which is sort of embarrassing to admit at this point. But then I was in another group after that. I joined a band called The Rescues. I didn't right. really join it. I sort of like, we all started at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So this band was started as three singer-songwriters and became four singer-songwriters. And these are people with whom I had played shows in town. And that band sort of got hot pretty quickly. And um, we had a bunch of, we wrote a record here in this studio uh, over the course of a month. 
Wow. And um, during, okay, so my timeline is kind of jacked up, but basically I went on, okay, let me back up. Because <laughs> yeah. this is also sort of important. <laughs> Although <laughs> I can, I've got to come up with a shorter version of this story. I've tried. <laughs> it's really hard. No, I want the whole thing. I, okay. want, I want the full. As long as we're here, I might as well tell it. So basically, yeah, yeah. So, so I made my last record, and then, and my, my, or maybe the second to last record, and my manager somehow finagled a tour opening for Alanis Morissette. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I was like, this is it. I'm going to be famous. Yeah. I'm going to be huge. I'm gonna, everyone's going to hear me. I'm going to get this huge audience. And, and they're going to be like, oh, my God, you're the greatest. And, like, here's all the money and everything you ever want. And so I went on that tour, and it was truly spectacular. It yeah. was amazing. It was the greatest time. And I went with my drummer, Adam Marcello, who's now Katy Perry's drummer, and, um, and my bass player, Carson Cohen, and my friend from high school, Alan Reinfuss, was our tour manager, <laughs> who, had, who had zero experience doing that. I just called him, and he's like the kind of guy you call, and you're like, this guy is going to say yes to this. Yeah, yeah. And say, to no money, but like a fun experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so... so we go on this tour and it was amazing. Like it was one of those things where like you just sort of, I mean, there were huge audiences. It's, yeah. It was a Lattice Morissette. set. Yeah. So, you, so it was these huge audiences all in Europe. So we we're traveling around with all our gear on trains throughout Europe. It was totally oh, yeah. insane. That's amazing. And, um, and I was opening, I was her opener. Yeah. It was really fun. I came back and there was no parade in my honor <laughs> for some reason. And, um, <laughs> And it was also before like the internet, really. It right. was before Facebook and all of these ways that you could sort of, you know, make use of these fans mm. that you had just performed for. Yeah. If that had existed, um, that would have been helpful. But I couldn't <laughs> like send postcards to like every person. I would, yeah. It just wasn't practical. There was no way to like capitalize on it. Anyway, I came back and David Schwartz called and he's like, hey, do you want to do some songs for this show that I'm working on? And I was like, yes. My wife was supposed to give birth right after uh, that tour. Oh, and wow. She did. So, and then he called, and I was like, oh, this is good timing. Because when David called, he had, like, money. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he was the only person that I knew that was ever calling with something that had money at the other side of yeah. it. <laughs> and so... Uh, so I went over there and, and we're like writing this funny song and this guy named Mitch Hurwitz is calling and it was for this show, Rest of Development. So we started writing songs like every couple weeks. Yeah. We would write some funny thing that was usually like a knockoff of some other thing that existed. And um, that was super fun. I was playing on them. I got to sing on a lot of them. We were writing them together and... Um, and it was sort of low stress and low pressure for me because mm. I wasn't, like, my life wasn't on the line. It didn't have, like, my name on it. Yeah, it was David's I just, name. It was David's thing. <laughs> anyway, so then I worked for So that w went great. I spent, like, a year or so doing that. And, um, and I, I continued to... We did... I did it all the way till the end. We, I kept going over there and... Um, writing songs all through all the seasons yeah and it was super fun and uh one of my most treasured gigs and also to work with him as an equal was was really uh important for me yeah yeah then uh i worked for him and under him and i was sort of like writing some stuff for shows that he was doing and uh and then, and I spent three years basically doing that. And um, then I got my own show. So right around the time I'm getting my own show, I, I did a pilot. My wife was like, hey, don't you know this guy? Didn't mm -hmm. he direct an episode of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I was like, yeah, so. so. <laughs> she was like, why don't you call him? <laughs> I was like, it like wasn't on my radar really. Yeah. To do that, because I was a rock star. 
Obviously, yeah. What did I need <laughs> to do that for? So I called him, and he was like, yeah, why don't you come to the set? So I go to the set, and, um, and I meet the creators, and they're like not really interested mm. in music, they, or they weren't at the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, they didn't really perceive there being music in this show. And, and Jason Weiner, who was the guy that I knew, the director of the pilot, was like, don't worry about it, just yeah. stick with me, <laughs> stick with me, kid. <laughs> and he was like my age, we were like sort of coming up at the same time. Yeah, and yeah. he was like, write me this, write me a theme, and it should sort of be like this. He had like an idea of what it should sound like, so I made him that, and, um, and a couple other little incidental things for the episode. And that was it. That became the theme to Modern Family, and wow, um, and that changed a lot of stuff. So, th so then, so right at the same time, the Rescues had a bunch of songs that were featured on uh, the Rescues as a band. Yeah, your man. Yeah. Um, that were featured on Grey's Anatomy, like five in a row, five big licenses in a row on a major show, and and. The final, the last one of which was like a, it was like they played the whole song. We had written it, not for that, it was like a Christmas song. Mm -hmm. We had written a Christmas song, basically, that was like this sort of like very warm, uh, beautiful gem of a Christmas song. And they licensed that song, they put it, it was like the season finale and it was snowing and people are dying everywhere and like the sound goes down, the music comes up and it was like the perfect placement of all, it was like the placement to end all placements. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and like literally the next day I got a phone call from Universal Republic here and they were like, hi, is this the rescues? <laughs> It was like some intern and they like have their analytics and yeah. like we had sold a bunch of downloads. Yeah. So anyway, that started a whole thing with the rescues and then ultimately we, we got a record deal. So now I've got a show and a record deal and basically the two worlds in which I was working and trying to figure some like, you know, just clawing my way, yeah, I mean, trying to figure something out suddenly they both kind of like broke wow. and um and that was a major time <laughs> <laughs> and we had this new baby i mean it was like out of hand yeah oh my god there was a lot of stuff that particular time right around what is it now 2019 so it was 11 years ago wow or 10 years ago 10 years somewhere around there 2008 <laughs> 2009 but before you, you got into television, uh, some of your early credits, you were working. I did video games. You did video games. Okay, right. So where did those happen? And I don't yeah. really know. I can't remember how it happened. Because really? we did a l bunch of games. Yeah. Most of them with Becky. All of them, I think, with Becky. Yeah, you co-composed with Becky. And um, Becky and I did... Ba the way that that started was because of the acapella group. The, the acapella group... First of all, Chris worked for a video game company. Oh, okay. And... His company came out to see our acapella group, Spiral Mouth, play a show at Luna Park, which no longer exists. And or at the time, it was a different thing. Now it's like a restaurant or something. Uh -huh. uh, and it was in a different place. Anyway, so we played this show, and we were like a we were basically like a rock band acapella group. Pedals, like distortion. It was like a rock show. Yeah. But without instruments, and. Um, so somebody from his company was like, oh, that would be cool to like have an acapella group do music for our game. And that was like Crash Bandicoot. Yeah. So uh, we did that. Crash Twin Sanity. Yeah. So they were like, that would be cool. And, and Becky and I wrote the music and we brought Sparrow Mouth in to sing it. And it was super fun. It was like the craziest and most fun. And it was, we, we were given like total freedom. That's amazing. In retrospect, like, I can't re even remember a time having that much freedom. It was like, and that in some ways is such a great thing about video games in general, because you're not scoring to picture. Yeah. You're there. I, I would imagine that it remains that way now that like, and I haven't done a video game for years, but, but that you are given such a huge amount of freedom. 
um, because you're not, you know, you just have to get the vibe right. If you're getting the vibe right, right yeah. then you're then you're done. Anyway, so we did that, and then that led to another game that was sort of similar, but the, when we started adding some instruments, and then that led to another series of games uh, called the Spyro series. Yeah, he did Spyro. I mean, Spyro the a huge, Dragon, huge which thing was for yeah, and those were like these big. Uh, they were like epic. Tales. Yeah, these amazing platforming games that were yeah. they're almost like an animated film come to life. Yeah. yeah, they were huge games, and they were and and so so suddenly Becky and I are writing like orchestral music and like these huge choral things for yeah. these for this series of those three games, and that was uh, really great. Then Vivendi Universal, which is who we had been working for, got bought by somebody else, mm -hmm. like Activision or something. Yeah, I forget. And then Activision that. got bought by somebody else. And then so sort of like by the time that happened, we were like, help, <laughs> what, don't you remember? Don't you remember all that great music we wrote? And, and uh, so that, so, so okay, at the same time, <laughs> Becky went off and had a bunch of children. So, so that, so the two of us sort of stopped doing stuff together at that point. Mm. And, uh, for like eight years, she went off and had a bunch oh, of children. Oh wow! And uh, and so during that time, the rescues happened and the TV stuff started to happen. And so then she came back and she's worked works with me and not with me. And we're but we're still like right next to each other right here. So when you're ready for us to write more video game music, we are right here. <laughs> So you would, you would go back to that world in a heartbeat? I think so. Yeah. It's super fun. I mean, we had the best time doing it. And it was the biggest music that I think I've ever been involved with in terms of like the size of the ensemble. We had these huge brass things that we would record and like a massive choir that like I basically contracted because I did a lot of session singing. Yeah. And um, so I would like get all my friends together and have this huge choir and we recorded it in a church. I mean, it was like really elaborate and big sounding music and um and interesting like really interesting and writing with becky is like she really pushes the envelope in terms of um harmony mm -hmm. and so that is a really it's just like a pleasure and we also have like a really good time working together so so yeah let us do more yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i think i mean game music is such a uh, it's growing i think and i mean i mean it's world, huge it's, it's huge. just as big as Anything. I mean, uh, no one understands how big games are. Oh, it's, it's the like biggest no matter part of how many film, TV, and music. It's the highest-grossing yes. yes. entertainment. But uh, no matter how many platform. times you tell that to people that are sort of not in the business, yeah, it's they like just oh, can't. It's they for can't, kids, it's toys. Yeah. yeah, they can't sort of wrap their minds around it. Yeah. So, and and it makes sense. Like unless you're doing it, unless you're a gamer, I yeah. think you don't really know. No, for sure. Anyway. For sure. <laughs> but of course, uh, a bulk of your career has been in television. And, um, you know, you've, you've composed scores to, I mean, fantastic shows. I mean, stuff like The X's uh, on TV Land and School of Rock, uh, Dawn of the Croods. Um, so take me through the process. Uh, a lot of people know the term pilot season. Yes. So for a composer, when you're trying to get a, a show, I mean, you, you, you described just your, your your story with Modern Family, but when you're during pilot season, what, what's it like for a composer during that period? When you're well, okay, that was particularly unusual. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, it was at the time that for me was not pilot season. That was me trying to figure out anything yeah. and to have like some kind of viable career. Yeah. I do remember at the time thinking, God, if I could only get my own show, mm. because I had worked with David on his shows. And I was like, God, it would be really like probably the next thing is like, I need to get my own show. And, and I remember actively thinking that how could that possibly ever happen? And that is an extremely difficult jump to make Yeah. from, from working actively in the industry for other people and with other people to sort of having your name on it. Right. It's extremely difficult and, and I don't really uh, have great advice for that other than, you know, meeting people. The more people that you meet, the more projects that you work on, you're, the more lottery tickets you're buying essentially. Anyway, pilot season for me now is actually different every year. Sometimes I feel like I need to sign up 
sign on to as many products as I can get my hands on. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the, if you look at pilots as a, as a whole, like, let's say there's a hundred pilots, which there's not, there's more than that. There's yeah. like 150 pilots. I don't know. <laughs> like That's also there's pilots that happen at different times of the year, but let's yeah, say it's yeah. like, we're talking about like network regular, like traditional network sure. pilots. Let's say there's a hundred of them out of those hundred. How many, uh, go to a series? <laughs> I don't know. Let's say, let's say there's 200. How many go to series? Like 20, maybe. Yeah. So maybe it's 10%. Um, and then out of those, out of that small group, how many then go more than like more than a season or two, half a season, yeah, yeah. one season, two seasons. If you can get past two and into three, then you're, then you're basically a hit. Yeah. So, and then I, I actually think that the, the days of a show like Modern Family where I mean, nobody knew that was going to be a hit. Nobody had any idea. Nobody knows that anything's ever going to be exactly. a hit. Exactly. You don't know. So until it's you out don't there. know. You just sort of like have to buy lottery tickets. And anyway, so now my pilot season is more like um, I still don't like get to totally pick and choose my project. Yeah, it's just and I've been doing this for a long time, and I do look forward to the day when I get to pick and choose my projects. On the other hand, I am sort of getting to a place where I can say no to things, and I also I always had a very difficult time doing that. Yeah, yeah. because I am like every other musician in that I struggled for a long time to figure out how to earn a dollar. Yeah. So to say no to someone offering you more than a dollar is like, it just doesn't compute. Yeah, it doesn't let you do, your body it's, doesn't let you do it. It's start, <laughs> yes, exactly. Your mind like is your like, body, don't let Your that mind go. is like, what are you doing? You can't, <laughs> so like, so I am trying to uh, do that. At the same time, I really enjoy doing a lot of different kind of stuff. Like I, yeah, I get a lot of pleasure out of doing animation for kids shows. I get a lot of pleasure doing like doing songs. So anytime I can get my hands on a, a project that has songs involved in it, that's also really fun for me. I really can get into like a really dark dramatic series. Yeah. And so having interest in all those different kinds of things means that I can say yes reasonably to lots of different stuff. Yeah. I'm also fast. So I say yes probably more frequently than some other people do because I can turn stuff around quickly that I think is still good. I'm not like turning it around fast just because were you like that before? You know what I mean? Yeah, were you like that before you got into television? Because television is a brutal schedule. Well, television has, has definitely trained me yeah. to be faster than I might normally be. Like, I think if I was not on a deadline every day, <laughs> that I would probably take more time. But I don't know. I also don't know if it's necessarily true that things sound better the longer you sit on them. Sure. So... I mean, often the most exciting part of making music is the very beginning. You make the thing and you're like, and, and you start tweaking the thing where your hands naturally go and mm -hmm. you sort of think about it a little bit and then you get to this thing that you really like and then you're like, oh, okay, done. And then the next thing is just like, make it sound good. Yeah. If it sounds good, you're done. So like, that's something that, that I think that, um, anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> going back to like, that, that schedule, what's a typical turnaround? Uh, I mean, of course, it's going to vary on, from series to series, but what's a, like a network series? What's between starting an episode to turning the music in finished? What's the, the time there? Well, it varies from show to show. Mm -hmm. um, Is there one that was kind of particularly hectic? And well, A Million Little Things this season has been extremely hectic. And it actually got like more hectic as the season went along because the schedule for each episode like we would start at like two weeks and then it gradually got closer and closer and closer until by the end of the season it i literally had like three days wow so to write 
and by the time you get there, you've developed a bit of a library, so you can try to uh, at least use like thematic material that mm. you've written already. Yeah. But you're still generating a ton of music in a very short amount of time. So yeah. like the other benefit though to being sort of to having the most hectic part be towards the end of the season is that uh, you're used to that show. Yeah. And you've like by the time we did that there was 17 16 episodes and so like when the last episode came it was I had already had history with the show and I sort of knew what I was doing. I knew my way around the template that I had made and my guitar player and I are like, you know, working, we're like, everything is clicking. So it goes faster a little bit as you go along. Yeah. And you, I also get a feel for, as the show goes along, how uh, the showrunner and the editors like stuff. Yeah. And so I can, so I'm trying to satisfy a few different things, including myself. But um, anyway, in other words, it can be anywhere from two weeks to like three days. That's for a drama. Yeah. So then you can have, so the other end of the spectrum is like Modern Family, in which there's practically no music. So like the theme is written, it's yeah. been done for 10 years. And... Then there's things, though, that happen, like on this week's episode, where there is a... I needed to do some bagpipe stuff, <laughs> so I had a bagpipe player and a cellist. <laughs> it was your, your classic bagpipe cello session. Of course. And um, so, like, you know, and then... But then that was it, like, for the episode. It was a cue, or maybe, like, three, three pieces of music that were all sort of related to this one. It was, they're basically yeah. whatever. So that's, like... No matter how much time, how little time they give you for that, it doesn't matter. It's not, there's no schedule. And they're always like very apologetic. They're like, listen, we need this by Thursday. It's like the previous Thursday. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're, you're giving me a week to do this? I think I could have it. I think I could do it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so it, it varies but from show to show. They're all, they're all, um, this new show that I'm working on is, I don't really know the schedule yet because yeah. they, they just started shooting. We don't even have a finished episode. So at the beginning of a show, and this sort of relates to your pilot question. Yeah, yeah. When, at the beginning of a show, when a show is just starting, your job is not just to write episodic music. Your job is to figure out what the sound of the show is. is that, so, I mean, that process, I mean, when you start a series like that, yeah, what, what, what is that process? How do you find the sound of the show? Is it just... And when, I guess, what episode down the line do you finally get in the rhythm? Where well, it's like... that's a good question. But for a million little things, I just like figured it out. And, and I, had, I had sort of pitched an idea of what the sound was going to be yeah. to DJ and Griff, who was the director of the pilot. DJ was like, I think there should be some guitar. And he talked about some other issues of the show. And I had read the pilot. So like... I and then so I came in with like a set of music like that basically like a like a version of what the score could sound like because mm. I had done some shows that were very guitar based before and I had done a drama that was pretty dark and and so I had like I had material in my library so I came to him with an idea of what I thought it could sound like and he listened down to that stuff and was like this is like pretty close so w once we got once he heard that then we started exploring some other things after we had footage. Mm. There was a lot of like stuff happening with flashbacks, so I had to figure out something for the flashbacks. Yeah. But this sort of overall concept of this sort of like organic based, uh, like, you know, like fingers on instruments, yeah. um, stuff that felt very real, pianos, vintage keyboards, um, acoustic guitars, electric guitars, things that are real hand percussion things that go like that mm. um that was like the direction and just sort of like space long phrases yeah yeah as opposed to like dense stuff and he was really into that and 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 so i did a pass of the pilot and like 
it was pretty close, like 75% of that stuff like basically lived oh, and wow. is still referenced by a DJ as no, make it more like the pilot. <laughs> like <laughs> that kind of, like when I try to like go over here, he's yeah. like, eh. He just, he fell in love with a lot of that early stuff and that's great. So that was a huge win. Sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes you, sometimes nobody really knows. Yeah, because it's funny, when you go back and you watch your favorite TV shows, you know, ones that last seven, eight seasons, and you watch that first season, you kind of see everybody getting the feeling, yes. not just the music, but the actors, exactly. the, 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 the way editors, it's shot, the editors, the lighting, mm -hmm. everything, everything is sort of like a work in progress at the beginning. You're making a brand new corporation yeah. when no one's ever met each other before, and then you don't even really know what the product is. Yeah. <laughs> so like, <laughs> And you don't know what the audience is responding to yet. You yeah. Know, so that probably You just have to things, sort of yeah. like use your gut at that point. And, and then, and also people talk, we just talk about it. And when the talking ceases to become useful, which is pretty fast when you're talking about music, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, they, you can be like, well, this should be like a marching band or this should be like a, you know, this should be, it should all be only oboes, like a, like a, like a, all different flavors of oboes. That's all fine until you actually hear it. You hear like an example and I'll make like a demo of something mm -hmm. and I'll just like make something so that, that we have something to actually talk about. And they're like, oh, no, definitely not that. <laughs> or, what, or, or yes, yeah. that's exactly it. Right. But usually it's like, oh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> so like at some point you have to like buckle down and like use your instincts and and be like, well, we talked about never having, you know, drums in this. But like, I kind of think it needs drums. Yeah. And you present it to them with the drums and without the drums and they're like yeah it needs a drum so though you at some point you're being relied on as the sort of in your great wisdom as composer guy yeah i mean <laughs> you have to kind of act as a, a therapy to the to the director yeah like if you <laughs> if you're like i really think this is working and they're like no it's not then you're like okay yeah but if you're like, I really think this is working, they're like, yeah, I think that's working too. And then it's like a big win. So like, <laughs> I don't know, you have to just sort of like roll with it. And that honestly is the hardest part of being a composer for media, as opposed to like an artist, which mm -hmm. is like where I came from yeah. uh, in my great <laughs> artist career. The, you know, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You're... And your manager is going to tell you, eh, on what on that whole song yeah or they're gonna be like i love that song but in when you're writing music for other people which is what composing music for media is when you're like serving the project which is something that i love to do you still you have to serve the project you have to like serve the people that you're working for and make sure that they like what you're doing yeah and appreciate what you're doing and that and you have to be able to take their criticism you have to be able to say uh okay i hated that too yeah yeah yeah. that was terrible yeah i don't know what i was thinking <laughs> i'm gonna do it again and it's gonna be double as good as that that was nothing where do you see this one yeah. so like that's hard i think for some people and they can't do this job they just can't it's yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> It's just one of the, it's just one of the parts of the job that is, it's not for everyone, which is why like, you know, writing music for media sounds like a great thing. I'd love to be like a whatever composer, but, um, are you, are you sure? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I mean, is it because, uh, I, I always look at like, I fell in love with filmmakers and certain composers and directors because they have a, a style yes. and a sound. So when you started you know, taking on your own projects, you do have to serve what they're looking for, but is it still possible to be an auteur? I think so, today, absolutely. In 2019. I, I feel like, uh, I think that, I think that even, even just now with this new show with a million little things, I think I have finally arrived at a place where like, I sound like something. Yeah, 
No, for sure. But I don't know if I did like <laughs> last year. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm using, I find myself using things that I wrote when I was, uh, when I made my first record. Wow. Thematic material that I come back to as being things that like I, I like yeah. sort of instinctively. And I know that happened when I was doing Rectify. That was like a four year series and it was very involved and, and there was a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of, that was sort of like the, almost the, the cable TV version to me of the score for uh, A Million Little Things, which is a little more straight ahead. Yeah. It still has these things that I love from that though. And the only thing that's difficult for me is like, how do you then compare that to like any cue from any comedy ever? Yeah. And I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Like when I listen back to all of the comedies that I've done, I hear a relationship between them. But I'm also always trying, especially with the comedies, to make them not sound the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like, <laughs> there might be harmonic things that are sort of like uh, things that I am sort of naturally drawn to. But, yeah. like, I'm trying to be different all the time, especially. And, and that's what they want from me. That's what the shows want. They want, every comedy wants to have its own thing. Yeah, they, they want, want to be its own identity, its own sound. And it has to. Yeah. And so I'm always trying to like use different instruments and use different production techniques and like use different samples and like yeah. all of the different things that you can do, different mixing techniques to make the comedies sound different. And same thing with the dramas. The dramas also want to have a unique sound. Sure. So like for those, it's just, it's a little more like, they're a little more involved, I guess. The, the comedies are so specific. You have to like nail it in a very short amount of time. Yeah, you have usually. less space to work with on yeah. a comedy because the, the comedy is on the screen. It's from the, either the characters or the, the, the dialogue. Yeah. Um, so on A Million Little Things, how much music is per episode on a show like that? Uh, you know, I don't know if I know the answer to that. <laughs> I think that if you asked the music editor, he would know, but the, I think it's between, I think it's usually around 30 minutes, which That's is a lot, lot of music. Yeah. That's including probably the songs. So it's some of which I do and some of which right? are licensed. 42 yeah, it's, total. Well, it's 44, I think. 44 total. Am I wrong? I think it's I in that know. area. <laughs> Somewhere With in that. commercials is an hour long, but. It, yeah, so it's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. And my favorite episodes happen to be the ones where there's less. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of music to write. There's a ton of music to write. And on a show like that, what about trying to uh, hit the right tone? Because it has some, you know, heavy things, but you're, you're, you're also trying to get to certain emotions. Was finding the right tone of A Million Little Things, was that a challenge? Or did you, were you able to hit that pretty easily? <laughs> well, I hit it, I think, close most of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'd have to ask DJ that question. Do you, of course, <laughs> There, sometimes I will nail it. I will give him this little jewel of a cue. <laughs> and then there are other times where like, I thought something was happening that wasn't happening. Right. So I write a piece of music based on what I thought was happening. He's like, no, that's not what's happening. And I'm like, oh. So then I have to redo that cue. But generally, like, I'm pretty close. That's good. <laughs> like, like I, you know, it's not rocket science, but there are also... There are subtleties in terms of emotional, yeah. in terms of emotions. And also sometimes I will feel something from like a particular piano chord yeah. that he won't feel and vice versa. Sometimes yeah. I'll be like, Music is I don't subjective. care yeah. about that. And why can't I just get rid of that? And he's like, no, 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 no don't mess with that one. So like, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. Like, that's just part of. That's just part of it. And we have some back and forth. Basically, I'll do a pass. He'll give me some, some thoughts. Mm -hmm. I will then mess with those thoughts. Usually by that point, we're pretty close. Yeah. And then it's just a matter of like little things here and there. Absolutely. 
So uh, across television, at least now, you know, there are kind of three key uh, types, which is like the one hour long single camera drama, uh, single camera comedy, and then of course the uh, sitcom, multi camera sitcom. Multi cam. Um, is My the, favorite. Is there is that your favorite? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Is there a different like is there a different approach you have for each types of those kind of TV series? Yeah. The, I mean, the reason I say it's my favorite is because they're they're generally easier. Yeah. Like, you there is a lot of that front end work of finding what the sound is. Mm -hmm. Once you have found the sound on a multi cam comedy, like, imagine Seinfeld yeah. for the just so that once you found that, that's it. It's, you're good. You make one hundred and fifty thousand cues exactly like that. Yeah. And you can go on vacation. Right. So. That's fun. That's really fun. So like you get like on some of them, like I'll get some guys together. Mm -hmm. Once I know what the sound is, I'll be like, okay, let's come in and just play this thing. And we'll play like 45 cues and then we'll chop them up and make them all sound and mix them differently and like mix some without the bass and mix some without the shaker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but that's, that's just its own, its own thing. Doing a multicam is its own thing. Single cam comedies are can be very difficult if they're really scored from beginning to end. I'm, yeah. I'm actually doing yeah. one right now. Because with Modern Family, um, there's nothing really score-wise in there, is like, No, Modern Family. Modern Family doesn't. Modern Family is its own thing. Yeah. It doesn't count in any category. Yeah, yeah. It has a theme. It has often a sort of like emotional wrap it up in a bow, as I like to call it, mm -hmm. cue at the end. Uh, that can be sort of, uh, it can be warm and it can also be sort of, it, sometimes it can even be dark, mm -hmm. but they're generally sort of warm. They have nothing to do with the sound of the theme. Yeah. The theme is like a big band yeah, shout chorus. Yeah. It has nothing to do with anything. Um, it's just a, I call the theme a badumpa, which it often is on any multicam. This is not a multicam, but it's a sort of, it serves the same purpose. It's, mm -hmm. a it's like a big ba dum -bum. Cold open, joke, ba dum -bum. Yeah. Into the rest of the show. And then there's basically no music in Modern Family unless there's something going on, uh, like, um, what do you call it? Diegetically. Diegetically like some the kind of, of the thing happening, like Alex or plays a cello yeah. or somebody like wrote a song or, or Dylan's playing a song or like... There's, you know, Phil is doing a break dance or whatever. Um, and then there is a cue at the end, mm -hmm. an actual cue. Earlier this week, I was asked to write a cue in the middle of an episode wow. for Modern Family. I, we will see if it remains <laughs> in the mix. Because I have been asked that maybe two or three other times in 10 years. And it never made it. And it never made it. Yeah. I, so, but things are like, you can see how they're like still innovating on that show. It's mind blowing. They it's have amazing, made, yeah. that show is like very, you know, it, it's just very beautifully made, I think, very carefully made. And they don't let anything sort of slip by they're not just oh well well you just we'll just put that in there. Yeah, <laughs> they just don't do that. Is it bittersweet They're that it's very conscious to an about end? how they do stuff? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, it's terrible that it's ending. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a huge part of your life. It is. Yeah, it is. I will tell you this. It's not. It. It doesn't take me that much time. But it's right. been a. I know them all now, and 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 it's such a, it's a, it's like a, pillow. It's like I've been it. I've been doing it for my whole professional career. Yeah, and to see it ending is sad. I also have other things that are beginning, and that's exciting. But it will always be. It's legendary. It's a legendary thing and to be involved in something like that from um, start to finish. From too. start to finish is like a. It's a very rare and wonderful and unique. Thing that is not lost on me, and I'm so proud of it, and I will be sad when it goes. Yeah, it's such a great show. <laughs> I will be. I'll be really sad. Neve, my assistant, is going to go to the set tomorrow, 
because Neve is a world-class trumpet player and mm -hmm. there's a trumpet thing that's happening. <laughs> that's <funny. laughs> so I think that Mitch has to play something on the trumpet like particularly badly. <laughs> and so Neve, but he has to look like he sort of knows. What, anyway, so Neve is going to the Modern Family set for the first time. That's exciting. So uh, another big thing about TV is the, the theme. You talked about Modern Family having a ba-dump-dump -dump kind of main theme. Uh, that kind of main title sequence. Uh, in Modern Family's case, it's not related to kind of any other music in the show, but what's the key to creating it that great? I mean, oh the Modern Family is one of them, I think, one of the most iconic. People hear it, those the first hey hey's, and they know yes. exactly what it is. I mean, what? How do you create a great main title theme? What's the? I the mean, key to I have it? a sort of cynical view of that. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I know how great I am. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but, um, you know, if you listened to, you know, 10 iconic themes yeah. from 10 iconic TV shows, completely out of context, having that show never existed, yeah. would that particular piece of music be something that would have like sort of stuck with you or does it stick with you because you watch it every week and you love those characters and it inspires all of those things because it's intrinsically connected to that show and yeah. that visual that happens when that music comes on it this is like a pretty cynical view of it no that's a great point but it's like you have to get it right yeah you have to like gilligan's island isn't the same without that song yeah yeah. But it could have probably been a different song. <laughs> like a different song about people living on an island. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like I'll give you another good example. Like relating to an island show. Lost. Yeah. Lost just has like a sort of like this weird Metallic like string sound, thing or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I never watched that show. So I, whatever you describe it as is probably closer to what it actually is. <laughs> So J.J. Abrams wrote it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, he wrote that. <laughs> He's like, I'll take the theme, please. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> it, thank you. <laughs> right. So, like, is that iconic? And is it? Could it have been something else? Probably, uh, yes, mm -hmm. and yes, it could have been something else, and that probably would have been fine. And, but, to get to your actual question, which is like, how do you make that thing? Yeah. Uh, I actually think that it's helpful. First of all, it depends on the kind of show. But like, let's say it's like a traditional, like, like it, let's say it's a comedy mm -hmm. of any sort. I think that um, coming from Songland is helpful. Yeah, for sure. Writing a song is is um, writing a pop song. Let's put it that way. Is like is useful training ground for making a theme song, I think. Absolutely. Because if it's something that, because if you can, okay, but there, there are problems with it also, because like, if you, especially now, if you've got 12 seconds, that's not very long. No. So you can do, but there's a million things you can do in yeah. 12 seconds. So I don't know. <laughs> does that totally not answer your question? No, it does because like, you do need a hook. You need. There's something. gotta be a hook. There has to be a. It has to be of an earworm. Some kind. That, but what is yeah. that hook? The hook can either be a melodic thing, or it can be like a, a horn honking. Yeah. Or it could be like you know somebody going. Tick, 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 tick. Or it could be like, I don't know. Like when, when we when I had the Modern Family theme, I did like four different things at the beginning. And then the fifth one maybe was like the thing. Mm. And then after that, I made like 20 more. Okay. Because uh, like basically I was working for Jason and Jason was like, okay, the director. And he yeah. was like, I like that one. And we we're like, great. Okay. So I, I gave him that one. He like played it for everybody. And everybody was like, great. And, uh, but Steve didn't like that. He wanted to do something completely different. Steve Levitan. Uh-huh. Uh, wanted to do like a acoustic guitar bass, something that was going to be more like what the ending cues were, something warm to show that this show was about more than just a badump up. Yeah. And so I did that for him until we had, were seven episodes in, having aired seven episodes already. Yeah. Anyway, so like to him, it wasn't done yet. Like we weren't there yet. Right. But to 
ever like Chris in Chris's mind we were done so yeah. like I don't know <laughs> I mean like you can you I've had other experiences where I have I'm kind of like circling a sound and I like hack away at it over and over again mm. for someone in particular or for myself like hacking away at like the mix or like the exact instrumentation yeah, or yeah. the exact notes and sometimes that actually makes it better. Hmm. Like sometimes you just didn't get deep enough into it. You didn't work yeah. hard enough at it to really get to something unique and interesting. And it is hard to do that. Yeah, like to sure. make something very short that really catches your ear. Because that, that's been described to me also as like, we need the theme to be like the thing that like gets you into the from the kitchen yeah, into calls the you, living room. Calls you in there. So to that sit down. I don't know who like said that whose <laughs> idea was that was, but like that make that always is in my head yeah. when I am making a theme. I want it to be the thing that you hear that brings you into the room. And one of the other things that uh, one of the reasons that there's a fill at the beginning of the modern family theme is because of that exact thing because. Mm -hmm. If you start right on beat one with just the, this gets really into the nitty gritty. <laughs> if you start on the downbeat without anything sort of leading you in to where the melody is or yeah. the heart of the cue is, then you haven't given, given someone time to get from the kitchen to hear the actual part of the music. Right. So like, like the Simpsons is a great example. My kids are like eating the Simpsons for lunch. They're in season nine i think they've been watching it since the summer wow. so like they're just killing it's it powering through <laughs> and <laughs> so the simpsons is like the simpsons so like you hear that you're like oh my god yeah that's perfect it doesn't even matter what the rest of it is yeah it's perfect yeah that's it's true. like a little thing and then you get the theme right so i try to do that also because <laughs> i think that's perfect <laughs> There's probably other examples of that. I never really think about it. Game of Thrones is a good one. It just starts like, dun, 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 but then it goes into the big Yes, thing. and then it gives you the melody yeah, after. Yeah. It's just like a little intro, and then you get the meat of it. I mm -hmm. like that idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Appetizer. That's how you do it. Then little appetizer, then the full meal. That's it. There you go. So easy. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, we were just uh, talking about uh, main title thing uh, themes, and you were talking about dra and drama. They don't. It's okay, not... yeah. So okay, so I'll give you the so the antithesis to the to the experience of writing a theme for a comedy is writing a theme for a drama where like often uh, it's sort of an afterthought. Yeah. In terms of the production, they're so busy making this long dramatic piece of work that the theme is not something they're really super concerned about. So like for a million little things, for example, the in the pilot we have a song that goes over the card so there was no theme I was like mm -hmm. oh man no theme bummer but <laughs> <laughs> but it was so beautiful the way the song was any I made this cover of this killer song and it ends with all these vocals at the end and it's very dramatic and goes over and so you hear like this reverb hanging over the card it was like awesome so nobody wanted to like drop a theme yeah. in there it didn't yeah. make any sense and the same kind of thing happened in the second episode there was another something that we didn't want to mess with and then by the time we got to the third episode, it was like a very clear moment where we needed like to put a piece of music over the card. So I took something that I had liked from a previous cue and like built something into it and then stuck it there and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> like it was cool. It, it was, sounded cool. It felt like it had a lot of the sort of like important ingredients of the show in one very brief theme yeah and and it was fine it was good and and i really like it and it, and in some ways the simplicity of it is so great it's, it's not trying too hard to do too much it's just like a little yeah, thing and, on a guitar and what i've noticed now with um which kind of, it's kind of a sad thing a negative thing that i'm seeing is that the, the netflix option to skip Oh my God! The main such a titles. Bummer. It's like, but I feel, but if you're binging, yeah, it can be annoying. But, but you often hear the end title. 
which mm. you never used to hear. That's right. Yeah, that's true. It would go right into some dude blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah, next, uh, next uh, up on blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so like now to be able to hear the end title, first of all, the end title is often a riff on the opening. Yeah. So that's cool. I'm I'm a fan of that. That that is that is great. <laughs> but it's yeah like uh, uh, it's a skip thing. I'm like no. Like, but, I, yeah, I like to skip. It like bummer. settles me into an episode. But uh, yeah, my kids still watch. They they can skip the theme to The Simpsons. They have the power. Yeah, that they watch it every time. You have to. <laughs> well, first of all, they watch it every time because the visual changes every time that's true and there's a so and that's the great thing about that, that is the secret if you want to have your theme music listened to put some change the visual yeah you got to see what Bart's writing secret yes you have to know movie. what he's writing and you have to know what lisa's going to play on the sax because that changes too and you have to know what's going to happen when they, sit when on they the get couch. on the couch yeah how they get to the couch brilliant genius <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It is. It's awesome. I that love that. It is one of the stuff. probably yeah, the best It's one of the best openings. themes ever. And yeah. everybody used to give Danny Elfman a hard time cuz he was like, "Oh, it sounds like the Jetsons and it sounds like the Flintstones." I think yeah. said, I think he said he wrote it on Great. a napkin at a meeting or something. I'm sure he did. <laughs> Like yeah, the would, most perfect theme ever. What a great paycheck to get. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, so to kind of uh, wrap things up a, a bit, looking at the entire process of your job, from that first note to that final, everything is finished. What's what's your favorite part of the process? Is there a part of it that you really look forward to every time? That kind of really. I liked what happened today. Today I got a new piece of footage from a new show. So that's starting. That is like pretty exciting. Fresh. Totally fresh. And. Somebody had an idea of something that could work, and I like start messing around with that. Yeah, and that was really fun. Um, what else is fun? Writing music is fun, top to bottom. This is a great job. Yeah. I love it to death. I feel like I love it more now than I used to. I used to be sort of more afraid of it, mm. and um, and afraid of. And I guess insecure about it. Yeah. And um, and now, I guess I feel like I know what I'm good at. I know things that I'm not that great at. And but the stuff that I am working on right now, the projects that I'm really fortunate to have now, happen to be things that are playing to my strengths. And maybe that's why I'm getting them. Mm, yeah. And and that whole pro getting to this point i think has been very difficult of of sort of being uh having my name associated with a particular kind of project yeah whether it's comedy or drama when there's sort of like songs involved uh and and very emotional things happening whether it's comedy or drama those are things that I'm proud to be associated with. And and so if I keep getting this kind of work forever, it's great. I mean, it's a great job. It's really fun. I love spotting. I love talking about where the music is going to go and what it's going to be. I love, um, I love recording singers, which is something that I get to do probably more than some people get to do. I like mixing. I like to make stuff sound good after it's been recorded. Yeah. So when I got to make the soundtrack for A Million Little Things, that was like, I was like back making records and that was like That's, something yeah. that I did for a long time. So that was a great uh, way to stretch those muscles and like, and do something different in the studio that like, you know, and like crank it and like put on different plugins and make yeah, stuff yeah. sound cool. And like, <laughs> that's just really fun. Like, it's all the stuff that like, when I went into the studio as, a college student that I was like, oh my God, if I could spend the rest of my life in a studio making music, that would be awesome. And I get to do that. It's like crazy. That's amazing. So crazy. I love it. Well, uh, thank you so much for the music you put out into the world. Thank it's you. It's just so fun to listen to. It's so great to get absorbed into and, and congrats on A Million Little Things and of course, 
the accomplishment of that is Modern Family. And thank uh, you very much. And Gabriel, thank you so much for for chatting. Today. Thank you. It was so much. My fun. pleasure. That was yeah. so fun. Yes. Let's do it again in two months Let's down do the road. In a brand new studio. At a brand new studio. <laughs>